welcome to all almost 400 of you that had registered for this webinar from the Nordic Bioplastics Association. Uh, I wish you could all be members of the Nordic Bioplastic Association, by the way. Um, my name is Bo Valtig. I'm actually the editor of the magazine Nord Emballage and uh, the oldest packaging magazine in the world and uh, the leading magazine in the Nordics. And we started the Bioplastic Association in nine years ago, actually in 2012, after some requests from the industry. And today we have around 70 member companies and it's growing all the time. Uh, our mission is to work as a lobby organization, of course, to try to make some impact on our politicians. That is not simple, but we are doing our best. Uh, we are also, of course, spreading information in and out from the companies, and we are creating a, 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 some networking, of course, between companies. It's not been easy the last one and a half years, as we all know. Uh, the pandemic situation has stopped that, and we had to start with these webinars, something that we will probably continue with uh, even in the future, even though it's not possible to meet in real life, so to say. And um, uh, we will do that next spring with our annual meeting, of course, and also with a big meeting in Denmark, in Copenhagen. So there will be a mixture in the future, but this is an excellent way to spread the message about bioplastics. And as we can see, it's a great interest. So I'm quite sure we will continue about this. Uh, step by step now, we are coming back into normal life, even if it maybe never will be the way it will, as we know it before the pandemic, but at least uh, uh, it's, it's getting in the right direction. Uh, but what has happened is that uh, there is a shortage of more or less everything in the world today, it seems to. Whatever you're looking for, it can't be delivered, especially because of the, the logistics problematic situation. Um, and of course, when it comes to plastics, we know there's been a big shortage of raw material and very, very high prices for fossil-based uh, plastic materials. And this is, uh, of course, something that can open a door for, um, for bioplastics, because if there's something that has been sort of a hurdle for bioplastics many times is that the price level is higher than for fossil base that has been extremely cheap for a long time. And that has um, made many companies to, to, uh, to think about not using bioplastics. And nevertheless, what they say about being a green company, money talks as always. But now the difference is uh, the, the gap is tighter and uh, it's, it must be more interesting for many companies to, to, to try bioplastics instead of fossil-based. But if so, we must also have uh, uh, some uh, possibilities with the materials so that we can deliver, so the industry can deliver. We, do we, maybe we have a shortage also in the bioplastics industry. That's what we are going to talk a little bit about today. And um, uh, we have three excellent speakers. We have um, Gunilla Laxo from Volke Group, Valky Group, sorry. We have Per Berglund from Holmen Igesund, and we have Gottfried Krapfenbauer from Agrana in, in um, Austria. And uh, the keynote speaker today is Gunilla Laxo. He's the category manager, direct material global sourcing in Valky Group. And I think, I, yes, one, one, two more things actually before I let her take over. Uh, question and answers, you can do that. Of course, you have a Q&A uh, in the bottom. Uh, put your questions there. We will do our best to, to ask them to the presenters, but there might be too many, and then we will try to come back with some more answers via mail or something like that. And uh, yes, the presentation will be distributed later on. So, and yes, we do record this um, uh, webinar, so there will be possibilities to see it again. So I think with that said, I think it's time for me to leave the, the picture and microphone over to Gunilla Laxo. You're welcome, Gunilla. Thank you so much, Bo. And um, let's see now. We'll um, shall start sharing the screen from my side as well. So 
so. So, uh, also from my side, I would like to say uh, a warm welcome to all of your uh, you participants in, in this webinar. And um, during this presentation, we will focus on trends in bioplastics supply. And as the header of, of the webinar is asking whether there is a shortage of bioplastics, we will elaborate this topic also from that perspective. So, Gunilla, we can see your presentation might be in a wrong okay. uh, format. Otherwise, I have it ready if you uh, need it to share it. Let me see now if, if you try try once more. Yes, of course. More on the screen. So There we go. Perfect. Just need to have it in full screen mode. Great. So now, now we can you're, all see. You're welcome. Thank you for your help. Thanks a lot. Uh, I represent Valky Group, and Valky Group is a growing company with uh, 90 years of history. Uh, the head office is located in Finland, and we have uh, 12 production plants, uh, and we are operating totally in 12 different countries. Uh, our budgeted turnover for this year amounts to 453 million euros, and we have a personnel of uh, 1,400. Um, over 80% of our products are already made from plant-based renewables, and we have a very uh, strong and, and uh, active uh, innovation and, and pr product development and around 3,000 test runs are made in our own pilot facility every year. We have uh, three business areas and uh, consumer packaging provides a barrier board uh, material, flexible packaging and films and bag bags. Industrial packaging again uh, supplies real packaging and ream wrapping for the paper industry and barrier lining materials for corrugated board and solid board applications. And our engineered materials business uh, area supplies construction industry with, with facings, construction membranes, and also the technical products for the metal industry and the automotive industry, as well as products for agriculture applications and sustainable solutions for imaging are included in, in this business area as well. So our mission is to accelerate the world's trans transition into a zero waste future, a very suitable uh, statement also for, for this webinar now. Now, let us start then focusing on sustainable plastics and specifically the trends within bioplastic supply. We will first define the framework and the key topics of focal interest. Looking from a zero waste uh, future perspective, uh, we can uh, group uh, the different sustainable products and packaging materials into renewable ones, which are not biodegradable ones, but then also recyclable ones and biodegradable and compostable ones. And, and then when including plastics in, in these uh, products and, and packaging materials, uh, renewable plastics can be from fully, partly or limitedly renewable feedstock. And for, for recyclable uh, products, again, uh, the common target is to uh, look for plastics reduction of, of the uh, products and, and, uh, and packages. And uh, if, uh, for example, looking at, at the coating of, of, um, of paper, uh, this can be done by means of, of, um, by, uh, of, of uh, dispersions, water-based dispersions. And uh, for example, with very thin layers of plastics on, on the paper or, or fiber-based material. And then uh, for film blowing uh, applications, then typically we, we strive more and more for monopolymer solutions. 
And it is worthwhile noticing at this point of time that uh, when, when talking about uh, or looking at, at plain fiber, plain uh, paper uh, material, it will not uh, provide good enough barrier for many applications. Uh, for example, to, to make sure that there is no uh, or less food waste in the supply chain. There is why we need plastics as well here. And then the biodegradable compostable polymers, uh, they can also be fully, partly or not at all bio-based. Uh, and uh, in this presentation, we will actually focus on, on two uh, technologies. Uh, the first one is, is extrusion coating. So uh, combining with plastics and different web materials, web-based materials, and, and then film blowing as well. Uh, we will pay less attention to like injection molding, thermoforming, and other technologies. So when we keep all the mentioned plastics-based sustainable product solutions in mind, we will then start looking at the supply trends. Uh, sustainable plastic supply for these different categories of, of uh, sustainable products uh, can be grouped and as we will look 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 at in, in a minute. Uh, I want to say that I have marked with dotted red lines uh, potential and past short supply as well as, as dotted outlines. And for current supply, I marked those with, uh, with uh, red lines and, and red outlines. So first, renewable plastics solutions. Uh, already today, uh, the major polyolefin ole producers, uh, also in Europe, can supply bio-based uh, products for, for polyethylene and polyeth polypropylene. And uh, tall oil is a very good example of, of this sustainable sustainable feedstock because it's a byproduct when making pulp and uh, in that sense it's a, it's, a, it's a very very good choice as a, as a bio-based renewable feedstock. Uh, another option is about uh, waste stream um, feedstock and, and those are typically based on, on used cooking oil or, or could be other types of animal fat as well. And uh, we, what we can say in common for those is that since there is still quite a limited demand, and that, that's, that's also why it's a, a bit limited supply. So this supply is based on mass balance principle. This means that uh, each actor of the supply chain uh, keeps record on and, and uh, ensures that the uh, bio-based uh, incoming goods totally equals the outgoing goods uh, and, and over a certain time period could also be percentage-based in, in this context. Uh, similarly, for uh, mass balance uh, supply principle uh, goes then the chemically recycled polyolefins or other, other polymers. Uh, they are also called circular polymers and uh, they are typically by means of pyrolysis uh, converted from, from, uh, from post-consumer waste, uh, plastics waste. And, and this means that these polymers, as well as those polymers, are totally identical to corresponding virgin polymers. Uh, and as I said, these are also still uh, applied by means of mass balance principles, because uh, we're still uh, awaiting in the next few years than, than a big, uh, big facilities to, to be able to provide uh, bigger volumes uh, without then using mass balance principles. Uh, we have had in the market for quite some time already uh, sugar cane based uh, pea, which is then totally almost totally based on, on sugar cane. Uh, this year we have seen some kind of, of uh, uh, scarcity of, of that, uh, that supply. And then we have the mechanically recycled uh, grades, which are, are then um, quite interesting now in today's world. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, actions are, are concentrated on, on developing these, and, and uh, currently we're seeing some kind of shortage of um, pure transparent uh, LDPs and LLDPs. 
uh, and and uh, as said, uh, there is a lot of efforts in uh, in place now in order to secure supply, and also to to build build new supply concepts possibly. So then let's move on to uh, uh, plastics for recyclable applications. And here, uh, when looking at, for example, extrusion coating technology and, and dispersion coating te technology, we normally don't have a, a shortage of, of the polymers used, which are typically acrylics, styrene butadiene, and styrene acrylics, and so on. But this year, with, with a couple of force measures in place, we had some, some scarcity even of, of, of those ones. Then when targeting monopolymer solutions, we can say that also fossil-based uh, polyethylenes uh, and polypropylenes uh, and also, also other polymers are, are characterized as, as uh, very sustainable ones, as, a, as an alternative to renewable ones, uh, because they, they can, can enable that, that the, the package materials, the packages, uh, the products are, are, are um, uh, recyclable as, as monopolymer solutions. What I could mention quickly is that using uh, MDO technologies is quite, uh, quite actually interesting for, for, uh, for this um, strive to, to uh, decrease, um, decrease the plastics content because with, with a machine direction orientation, you can actually maintain uh, the similar barrier properties and, and also other properties, even if reducing the plastics part quite substantially. Then we go on to the biodegradable plastics. And, and here um, uh, we can see that we have a variety of, of different polymers. And, and uh, we need to, of course, remember here that uh, compared to all plastic supply, the biodegradable ones are actually still, still um, uh, limited in, in supply. If we could talk about some percentage uh, of, of the total global plastic supply. Here we could see last year some sort of shortage in PLAs, uh, and uh, uh, this has not really been the fact this year. And, and the reason is most probably uh, that uh, the horeca sector, hotels, restaurants, and catering, has been uh, facing lower demand uh, due to pandemics. But instead, this year uh, there has been a clear shortage of the polymer biodegradable polymer PBAT. And, and the reasons are to be found uh, in, in, different, um, in different sources. Uh, one reason is that we have seen a huge, huge, hugely increasing demand in China, which we'll come, come back to after a while. And the other reason is that there is a shortage of uh, this year in, of uh, butane diol. And that is not only used for, for um, biodegradable plastics, but also for, uh, for the construction industry polyurethanes and, and, and also for sports clothing, for example. Uh, last year, we saw uh, some scarcity uh, in, in uh, succinic acid, which is a raw material for bio-PBS. Uh, but even if uh, there is very limited capacity of, of PBS and bio-PBS in the world, also for PHA or similar, um, uh, similar polyhydroxyl uh, alkanoates as, as PHA, uh, there actually has not been very much of a shortage this year. Uh, important to notice is that when using these kind of biodegradable polymers in, in the technologies that we said we focus on now today, extrusion coating and, and, uh, and film blowing, these polymers need to be compounded. And, and not, typically two different polymers are, are, are combined in, in, um, in, in one uh, compound, uh, for example, PLA and starch, uh, TP, TPS, if you like, and, and starch and, and PBAT. Uh, and the reasons are, are the following that, uh, first of all, uh, there is a strive clearly towards uh, bigger and bigger bio-based content, uh, which can be enabled by, by combining these polymers together in the compound, but also uh, to uh, achieve certain uh, processability requirements of the machines uh, which are in use, and also uh, not least uh, to, to, to reach certain product properties. Uh, currently, we can say that even if there is shortage of some, some of these polymers, uh, there is not basically shortage of com compounding capacity. Uh, important to notice. Um, then looking forward, how the demand trends may be developing of the various bioplastics. 
uh, we have several factors that, that certainly are, are um, affecting this. Uh, and to start with EU legislation, uh, the Biowaste directive, directive will be in force as of uh, 2023 and will, will uh, actually make Biowaste uh, collection mandatory within EU area and will have a lot of, uh, of uh, Im implication also on, on how we are handling, handling different kinds of bioplastics in different areas. And also the uh, totally now uh, renew uh, or which will be totally re renewed now the packaging and packaging waste directive uh, it will be interesting to see towards the end of the year uh, what how, how it will tackle then then the 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 approach to to different bioplastics but it will certainly have a, a very big impact on on on, um, on the EU, EU countries then the EU member states, of course, have their own legislation. And we can say, like, examples that um, in Southern Europe, we see more of, of um, favorizing biodegradable plastics, whereas in certain um, Central European countries, uh, there is more focus on, on um, uh, recyclable grades. And uh, in Scandinavia and Nordic countries, uh, fiber-based solutions are, are certainly prioritized in, in, in many respects. But as mentioned earlier, for many applications, like for food packaging, especially, so also plastics are needed to, to a certain extent in, in combinations. Then we have the brand owners' impact on, on, on how the trends will develop. And, and here it's interesting to notice that large brand owners have been so far um, giving priority to recyclability and, and reusability prior to, to biodegradability. Uh, and then consumers, of course, for a consumer, it's very concrete and very tangible to use a biodegradable, uh, compostable bag instead of, of, um, of, of something else, because uh, then the consumer can clearly see his, his contribution to, to, um, to increase sustainability. Uh, as mentioned earlier, then Chinese regulation is really impacting quite a lot now the global demand of biodegradables, because last year uh, there came a new regulation, basically banning uh, plastic bags and, and um, and also with some other uh, single-use uh, bags. And, and this has led to a really a massive increase in demand of, of, um, of some of the biodegradable polymers and also a massive uh, increase of, of capacity now in, in, in the coming years. In uh, US, uh, we can say, could say that it's something between uh, EU and, and China in that uh, there are the federal guidelines and, and um, there are certainly very different approaches in, in different member states as well. And, and uh, for example, the West Coast, uh, there are a lot of, of biodegradables are, uh, are, are used and, and, and then in the East Coast with, a, with more of, of an infrastructure than... than um, that their uh, one focus is more on on on, on recyclable um, products. Pandemic has obviously also had an impact on 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 certain certain, for, for example, and and maybe in front of all then then biodegradable plastics demand during this year. Um, then let's uh, use a few moments to have a look at, at how the uh, biodegradable plastics uh, supply chain trends are, are developing. And it is interesting to notice that uh, traditionally all the uh, actors in the supply chain have been, have been separate, uh, separate companies, raw material providers, polymer providers, compounders, converters, brand owners, retailers, etc. Uh, but there is a clear uh, trend of integration. So, for example, between polymer providers and compounders, we see that, uh, but also backwards in the supply chain to, to raw material providers. And lately, even uh, somewhat then, then uh, in involving some, some converter also in, in the supply chain. So, quite interesting uh, development trend in, in, in this, um, uh, this biodegradable um, supply. And also important to notice is that uh, polymer suppliers obviously are, are very, very strong in, in the supply chain and, and, and um, communicate quite, uh, quite much about high value and try to promote high value growth application to brand owners and, and retailers and so on. Of course, knowing what capacity is coming up in, on stream in, in, in different areas. 
Um, so that is an uh, in, in interesting trend. And, and then um, if we if you have uh, focused so far on on uh, on uh, different bio bio based and renewable solutions and 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 uh, recyclable solutions and and then then um, then how how the uh, supply trends um, and integration trends uh, develop in, in biodegradable so let's also have a look at the the global uh, factors affecting then then how um, how the supply and demand balance is is uh, is um, is going forward, and let's have a look uh, by uh, different uh, biopolymer uh, types uh, on this map. Uh, starting with PLA, as uh, certainly most of you know, there are two two big uh, suppliers of um, of PLA-based uh, polymers: NatureWorks in US and Total Corbin, which is a plant in in Thailand. Uh, typically, there are, the plants are, have a capacity of 75,000 uh, tons. NatureWorks uh, plan to invest uh, to be ready uh, a new new plant by 2024, and Total Carbon, in uh, correspondingly uh, 100 kilo 100,000 tons capacity in, in 2024 as well. Then we have a lot of of actors in in China, and obviously we cannot prove all the current capacities and, and, and upcoming capacities, but, but just to give you uh, some kind of a, of a flavor of, of how the capacity is, is being built up. So we can see that there are a lot of, or several multiple actors and, and, and uh, capacities is, is being increased, predominant, predominantly then for supply to, to Chinese market. Uh, then we have the PBS, where uh, obviously PTTMCC, located in Thailand, is, is the, so to say, global uh, supplier, also coming in material for, for Europe, for example. And then we have the uh, Chinese Chinese suppliers, uh, which are then mostly concentrating on, on domestic supply. PAJ uh, really um, started with, with Kaneka supplying, and they are obviously building quite a lot of new capacity now in coming years. And then we have Danimer and Raj WDC in, in US also looking for uh, building out capacity quite a lot in, in, in coming years. And then again, Chinese and, 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 um, and uh, Southeastern Asian um, providers. PBAT, as mentioned earlier, it's been, uh, it's been really uh, facing scarcity during this year. Uh, we have capacity in, in, in Europe. Uh, and there is a lot of capacity coming on stream uh, in coming years in, in Asia. BASF and Red Avenue communicated last year about the joint venture and the new plant will obviously be ready in, in 2022, so next year. And then we have multiple and multiple uh, new, new providers in, in, in China. There are even talks about... Uh, capacities of above 1 million tons uh, coming on stream very soon. And there are several suppliers uh, not mentioned all and not, not even know about all, all of them. But, but it's interesting to notice uh, that uh, here is really invested. Now, I'm obviously quite a lot ba based on, on uh, what, uh, what the Chinese legislation now say about, uh, about different bioplastics. Uh, starch. Uh, Approximately, probably two percent of all the starch uh, produced in the world is being used for, for, um, for thermoplastic um, starch uh, polymers, and and here we have quite some good capacity and and also growing, uh, not least in, in in Europe, obviously. But what is interesting now for coming years is that uh, that um, uh, there is coming new supply, but a lot a uh, lot in. China, Southeast and Asia, and, and also in, in, in US, uh, compounding capacity seems to be enough, at least with current supply and demand. But as mentioned already by Bu in the beginning, uh, this year we have really seen a lot of challenges with um, global, uh, global transport. And, and uh, it still goes on, there's very limited um, container ship capacity, and there is limited container capacity. and, and uh, and, and uh, it will be, uh, we have seen uh, yeah, transport costs going up by five times, six times maybe even. And, and uh, it's not likely that this will start normalizing uh, very shortly now. So probably this uh, global sea freight uh, challenge will, challenge, challenges will continue. And it's something to keep in mind, obviously, then. 
I said I'm not going into uh, listing co compounders here, but just to give you a picture of the base polymers now for, for this uh, biodegradable sector. So uh, to summarize, uh, we see that uh, we have several options for su sustainable plastics, renewable, recyclable, and biodegradable. Uh, Bio-based uh, non-degradable capacities being provided or supplies being provided by the major polyolefin suppliers already. And the same goes for, for, uh, for other polymers as well. Uh, and there is good, there are good uh, prerequisites for, for ramping up volumes now in, in the very near future. And the same goes for circular polymers, chemically recycled, which, which are uh, identical to, to, uh, to virgin polyolefins uh, when capacity is on stream now after, after a few years. Uh, mechanically recycled, as we said, uh, interesting sector now uh, and, and uh, some scarcity during this year. And of course, important to mention that, that these grades are, are by far not uh, equal to, to uh, virgin grades. And, and they cannot be used for, for, for direct, uh, direct food contact or for, as food contact materials. Bioplastic trends are impacted by several things and interesting to see now the upcoming packaging and packaging waste directive for EU and how, how that will guide, guide our, our journey in the sector. And biodegradable polymers, a uh, lot is happening in the supply chain in terms of integration and new capacities coming on stream, especially in Asia, uh, but also in 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 um, in US and unlimitedly in Europe. So uh, there is a, a good development going on, a lot of trends, a lot of challenges, but they can all all be overcome. And let us continue together our journey towards a zero waste future. Uh, we can all have our uh, contribution also as businesses. So thank you very much for listening and thank you for my part. Thank you very much, Gunilla. That was perfect and perfect timing also. Well done. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see if we have any questions. I don't think there's been so many yet. Uh, I think you were very clear in your in your presentation, actually. <laughs> Let me Thanks, see here. <laughs> there we are. Those are more about the supply. We have one here. Do you supply polyethylene slash polypropylene from bio-based byproduct feedstock, for example, tal, tal oil, or do you have names and companies that do that? Well, as mentioned, uh, uh, the major uh, polyolefin producers also in Europe can, can provide that now. As Valky, we are a converter. I, I, I didn't want to give the message that we are doing all of this. I, I just wanted to give a, not only from Valky perspective, but a general market overview of, of, of these, uh, these supply chains. So yes, you can get uh, talloil based and you can get... Uh, get also other bio-based uh, polyolefins uh, from several suppliers in Europe today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, almost a similar question. Do you supply polyethylene slash polypropylene from waste stream or do you have a name on companies that do? There, there also you can, you can turn to, to a couple of the major uh, polyolefin providers in Europe. And we have someone, something here. Do you have any comment on the energy needed for the different options for renewables? Um, that I don't have uh, just re ready to, to, uh, to share now, but it's something we can look at uh, to, to be, be shared later on if, 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 if um, it's, uh, it's plausible. Okay. Uh, well, I have a question here also. Which material, which bio plastic do you find most interesting? And uh, now and maybe in the future, do we have a favorite, so to say? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting question. Yes, I would say that uh, I, I I do like all the options because uh, depending on the context and depending on what what uh, customers are asking for and brand owners, so, so uh, there is always an option, and that is kind of a guideline for Valky Group as well as we are a converter. We want to enable all the solutions for our customers. So it's up to brand owners, it's up to retailers to use. We want to be able to supply supply all, all the um, possible packaging materials and, and products. So uh, no favorites, I cannot say any favorites, <laughs> but uh, but it's good that we have the options and that basically all the options are, are being really uh, built on now and, 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 and increased in supply. 
I did mention when I started this that that uh, the the price gap between fossil based and and bioplastics is smaller now. Do we have the same feeling, or do you think that is something that gains bioplastics? I think that's difficult to say, and 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 uh, it it really remains to be seen now how this uh, shortage of of um, of normal plastics, say like fossil based plastics, will, will develop as well. But um, but I think when depending on now uh, which uh, stream will will really uh, gain more popularity now, so it certainly will have an impact on on price as well. So the bigger the volumes, uh, normally the the more the prices are are, are reduced as we know. Okay, let, let me just ask one more question also about, um, I mean, we are here in Sweden and you are in Finland. What, what, how is the discussion going on about bioplastics in Finland? If you look at the political level, is there a discussion about bioplastics and, and their position on the market and all that? I think there is in every country now, in every every country in Europe and and. and uh, and, and it's getting more and more important, uh, really, to to to, uh, to to be able to, first of all, understand where we are and what what are the real options, and 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 uh, and also how can we con- contribute. So there's there is a lot of discussions and also quite quite interesting. Like uh, there have been some interesting training sessions even on television now to to try to to guide the normal consumers on on what what do these options really mean in practice. And and the same goes for all the countries where we operate as as Valky Group, twelve countries as mentioned. Just uh, some quick questions as an ending of your presentation from Maria here. What main feedstocks are used for PHA today, and what trends are there? Well, as we looked at at, at the the um, uh, the. Um, uh, slide about uh, about that one. So for PHAs, uh, so uh, so we have um, uh, we have uh, we have several. It's, it's uh, everything basically goes goes back to to uh, to the um, uh, to the uh, you know um, oils oils uh, which which are derived then from from uh, from from um, uh, bio based uh, bio based sources and and then via via certain. Uh, certain um, medium medium raw materials last question how do you see single use plastic directive in relation to your products uh, how does a single use plastic directive affect your company yeah that's a good question um, we are actually uh, as a company i mean the part uh, of uh, single use products is not uh, massive for us uh, as we are a lot also in in non packaging products but of course it it, uh, it it has an impact and that's why why i presented this this like we we look for for uh, for um renewable solutions we we look for for recyclable solution and and also biodegradable solutions so so we need to find find ways of of, of meeting uh, all, all the legis- legislation now and 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 of course it's it's taken into account and and we try to build on 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 our product development in order to 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 have a, as a guideline uh, guideline this this uh, sustainability in order really to 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 be um uh, to be a contributor to to uh, not 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 uh, not uh, increasing waste, but to uh, but to reduce waste. As our mission is is uh, towards a zero waste future. So more more and more solutions that that, uh, that uh, do do get rid of of uh, of uh, the the necessity to to go for 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 um, incineration or, or or landfill options. Okay. Now, since we started, there's a lot of questions coming in, but we don't have time for them now, unfortunately. We <clears throat> we will we will let you know know the questions, Gunilla, and maybe you can answer them by, via mail or something like that. That's so I, I have to say thank you here, and we have to go to the next presenter. Thank you very much, Gunilla. Thanks a lot. Thank you all. And the next uh, presenter is Per Berglund. He's a product manager, value added products at Holmen Igesund. And he's going to talk about something that's really interesting also right now, because, you know, it, there is a clear trend today to produce um, uh, things that are produced by fossil-based plastic today by fibers instead. And we see a lot of trays and so on. But normally, they all need some kind of coating or barrier to, to work, at least in the in the food industry. And there's a lot of work with barrier coatings that could be also seen as... Um, that could be fossil free and make it easy to recycle those products. 
And now Holmen Igesund has um, uh, one example coming up. They call it BOE. I don't know what the E stands for, but I'm sure Per can explain that. And the, the, the headline is BOE takes barrier coatings a step closer to becoming completely fossil free. So Per, the screen is yours. Welcome. Yep, thank you very much, Bosse, for an excellent introduction. And that's correct. I'm I'm a product manager for for uh, in um, Holmen Egesund for value added products and also a board quality that we call Inverform. And Inverform is basically a, a board, an uncoated board for for pressed, traced, and stuff like that. Uh, so I'm here to. Um, so to present our new uh, newest addition in our um, product family, uh, we call it BioE, and it's a biodegradable coating that is um, heavily reducing the carbon footprint. So I, on the agenda for today uh, is a bit of different type of plastics and bioplastics. I, Gunilla has already touched a bit on it, uh, upon it, but I think it's, it's good to take, uh, take a stand from there. So we know what we are talking about. And then coming into the BOE, the features and the benefits. And then something about typical plastic properties. How does BioE stands up compared to, to other plastic alternatives? Uh, and then where to find documentation and samples and so on on these products, and then a Q&A. So I, I'm sure that many of you have seen this many times before. You are a well-educated uh, and interested uh, bunch of people in, in this area, so, so, but I repeat it anyway. Uh, so, so we normally divide plastics into these four quadrants. Uh, you have conventional fossil-based plastic that is non-biodegradable and coming from non-renewable um, raw material, such as standard poly, uh, polyethylene, polypropylene, and polyester. And then we have biodegradable Plastics that comes also from non-raw material, uh, non-renewable uh, raw material, such as PBAT, for for instance. Um, and then we have bioplastics that comes from raw renewable raw material that is not biodegradable, uh, such as 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 um, Gunilla mentioned, talol or, or pine tree oil or um, uh, plastics from um, sugar canes. And then we have plastic that is both from renewable raw material and biodegradable. And here are where we, let's say, position our BioE. Um, it's the main component in BioE is, is PLA and also some PBAT. So the features and, and benefits of it, what, what is bio? It, it comes from 75% renewable raw material, uh, and it's approximately 75% PLA and roughly 25% of PBAT. Uh, of course, there are some additives and, and other stuff, but, but in, roughly this is, is the case here. And I can mention also that the PBAT, it's, it's already today possible to, to replace some of the fossil parts with material from raw, uh, renewable raw material sources. So the, it's, it's work ongoing there. So we hope, hope that the, the footprint in these kind of products will improve even more uh, in, in the coming times. Uh, bio E is biodegradable and approved for industrial composting uh, certificate uh, issued by TÜV in Austria. And it's um, approved both as separate components, both board in itself and the compound in the coating in itself. And the new thing here is that it also in combination, it's uh, approved for industrial composting. 
the functionality is very comparable to, to standard polyethylene. And it has one advantage compared to standard poly, uh, polyethylene is that it's, it's approved for, also for use in microwave ovens, not in conventional ovens, but in um, microwave ovens. It has very low taint and odor values, so that makes it suitable for, for a vast amount of different packaging applications. I, I could say that the most common uh, for us with this product is uh, um, ice cream cups, coffee cups, and, and different kind of, of food packaging. Yeah, on the on the right side, it, it's pretty much a, let's say um, a repetition of what I've already said. Typical plastic properties here. I mean, if we compare it to, to other plastics, um, you can see here on, on the left hand side that the, let's say the melting point and the usage, the temperature tolerance is pretty much similar to, to polyethylene. Um, not as good. It can't stand as high temperature as, as polypropylene and polyester. Uh, and, and looking here to to, to other, let's say, features of it. When it comes to sealability, on, on the left hand, there is polyethylene, here is poly, uh, bio E, and polypropylene, and on the fourth uh, column here is, is polyester. So when it comes to heat sealability, you see it has quite good capabilities. It's not a very good moisture barrier, and that is due to the composition of of um, of, uh, of bio bio e you you can in, in many ways it's it's uh, the construction is is similar to to uh, poly um, polyester it's a very good um, grease barrier an excellent uh, oxygen barrier and the temp resistance here is, and I can understand that this is a bit confusing, the same here, but a little bit different here. But this is just to visualize that, that you can use it in microwave ovens. And as you know, different kind of plastics, a different kind of polymers doesn't melt in the same way. Um, and bio -E, information and technical data sheets, you can find it um, on igesund.com. You, you do go in on the products there, and there you can find it. And when we, we normally apply it on two different board grades. It's Invercoat GP, that is, is, a, is a board that is, has a coating, a clay coating on one side, and is, is uncoating on the reverse side. And also on what I mentioned before, in the form that is uncoated on both sides. And you can go in here and read a lot of things about this. Yeah, um, additional information, as, as said, uh, on igesund.com. And if you want samples, you can order that via our sample room and you have a the mail address down there, provrummet dot um, at igesund.com. And it's available in A4 and also in 72 by 102 centimeter samples. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Question. Questions. Let me see here, Per. I must take a look. There are some questions coming in. Um, there is someone, some questions. Let's see here. They move over to that. Um, uh, if the product ends up in nature, what will happen? Will it spread? Will it spread microplastics? Yes. <laughs> it is not approved for home composting and not for my marine, let's say. It's not uh, biodegradable in, in a marine environment either. Uh, in order to, to decompose it, you need to add 
let's say, heat and energy. And that is what you do in, within the industrial composting uh, process. But you still have reduced the carbon footprint by, by at least 75%. Can this bio E certificated as an UN approved for dangerous chemicals? I think it depends on what kind of chemicals. So, so please contact me afterwards and and. Uh... Mm -hmm. Since we do not have any industrial composting in Sweden, but we are very good in getting even better with the site zero, I wonder how mechanical recycling are a place, uh, apply, 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 applicable to the BUE. Yeah, it, it is to, to the same. I mean, you should place the, the, the packages in the, pa in the paper waste streams. And... Of course, it's not identical to, let's say, standard polyester, polyester and, and uh, polyethylene, but it's, it's suitable also for mechanical, uh, let's say, retraction. But to be honest, most of what is collected, and it varies, of course, depending on what region you, you are, we are talking about, but you, you usually uh, sort out the fibers and you reuse them, and then the plastic part goes for incineration. Okay. Which layer thickness is used on the film? I suppose it depends also. Or... Yeah, our standard offering is between uh, 25 to 35 grams per square meter. Mm -hmm. And how is that compared to traditional uh, coatings? Quite similar, right. quite similar to, to, to polyethylene, a little bit more in, in weight, uh, but not in thickness, because this is a very high dense uh, product. So even you, in order to reach the, the needed thickness, you need to add a little bit more compared to standard polyethylene or standard polyester. And how, this is a question for me, how does that affect the price? compared with the standard polyester. Yeah, it, it, it is, of course, a little bit more expensive, but not as dramatically as you, you might think. Okay. So I, if, I, if, if I'm a customer, I should not be scared for it. So no, say, oh, absolutely uh, not. No, no. Absolutely not. Um, is the, but is this, this is something that you can only buy together with Igesund material, like in the coat. It's not, you cannot buy the coating material in itself. That's correct. I mean, we are not, let's say, producing any any coating or or any kind of these polymer. We we buy them and, and then we apply them on top of our board grades. Okay. So if you like BUE, you must have Invercoat or something like that. That's correct. All right. Brilliant and business. I, and <laughs> and I, I I see no reason why not loving Invercoat. <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, but it is on the market. How, how new is it? It's it's very new for us. We launched it the first of September. Okay. I mean, the technology as such is not new. This is nothing uh, revolutionary or, or or anything. It's it has been an existing um, technique or, or uh, for, for quite some time. But for us, it is new. And how does the customers um, react to this? I mean, is it uh... It's a great interest, uh, or is it something to have to push on to them? So to say? No, absolutely. It, it's a great interest. And I would say, especially from the middle and southern parts of Europe, they have, up here in the Nordic, we are, at least in my opinion, the trend is more and more to go to actually recycling. Uh, and in southern Europe, you still, compostability is a big issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was a question about that. Since industrial composting is not available in Sweden, are you aiming for the market outside of Sweden? Yeah, we we prefer the, the, to, to, to circulate the, the, the board and, and to, to retrieve the, the fiber as, as fiskebu in, in, in Sweden mm -hmm. and then uh, use the plastic for 
for something or for energy if nothing else is available. Can you get the fiber? Can you get fiber tear when heat sealing with this coating? How is the strange? The strength, uh, it, it's very much comparable to, to uh, standard polyethylene. The biggest market for this is actually coffee cups, if you talk volume. Uh, and there you need to have a very good sealing capability. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you still haven't answered what the E stands for, I think, by your, by your E. Uh, our our <laughs> former... <laughs> Our former um, uh, biodegradable product was called BioP, and then we thought this, yeah, it sounds en environmentally friendly. Okay, <laughs> that's the question. And it is. Answer. It sounds and it is. Yes. Okay, Per, I think uh, we have to leave you there, and thank you very much for this presentation. Excellent. And uh, there are still questions for you, but I say the same to you as I said to Gunilla. We have to come back to that. We'll be Otherwise, happy to. we will run over, and I think our, our friend down in Austria is waiting now. So thank you, Per. Thank you. Yes, and then we are going to, to go to our last speaker, Mr. Gottfried Krapjenbauer from Agrana Starke GmbH. He's a sales director, technical specialities, and he's going to tell us a little bit about starch in biopolymers. And uh, I wouldn't say I'm an expert. I think starch has been one of the, 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 the materials, the raw materials for bio, biopolymers that has been with us for a very, very long time. And I think, I hope he can confirm that. But uh, Mr. Krapfenbauer, please uh, explain this for us. So good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me and see the presentation? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, hello again <laughs> from Austria to the north of Europe. Where it's a great pleasure to, to be with you and, and to say some words about, about starch uh, in, in bioplastic in bioplastics, and it's not about how starch can be processed or hydrolyzed or fermented or converted to PLA or, or other polyesters. It is really about starch and the molecule as, as such uh, in, uh, in the usage uh, when using it into, in, 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 in bioplastics application. But uh, before stepping into the topping uh, as such, let me uh, introduce uh, our company to, to you. Um, Agrana is a company, an international company, refining agricultural raw materials and turning them into a range of, of industrial products uh, for, for food processing industry, but also for non-food industries. Uh, we have 9,000 employees, uh, 56 production sites around the globe and 2.5 billion uh, euro uh, revenue a, per year. Uh, our main three segments are fruit, sugar, and starch. In the fruit uh, segment, we are the world market leader in, in the production of, of, of uh, fruit uh, preparations. We are leading sugar uh, company producer in Central East and Southern Europe. And uh, we are a major manufacturer of customer specific starch products. Geographically, uh, fruit, of course, most important, uh, spread all, all over the globe. Focusing uh, these days on Japan, uh, India, Mexico, um, Egypt, uh, the sugar uh, mainly producing in the, in the eastern part of Europe uh, from uh, beet, but also from sugar cane. And we in the starch segment, uh, we produce in Austria, Romania and Hungary. And for most of the products to be delivered and worldwide. We, especially at Agrana Starch, we focus on highly refined specialty products, and especially for the non-GMO uh, free, for the for the GMO free starches, the organic starches, and in the technical starch products area, we have, we have a leading position around the globe. Our products, where do they go to? Into food and baby food, cosmetics, pharma, all becoming more and more important in the context of of microplastics. Uh, animal feed, textile, 
paper, corrugated board, also very important these days. Uh, um, ethanol becoming more and more important. Sweden recently took here uh, uh, took a step here recently. Uh, construction industry also one of the world market leaders for special starch products. And our last but not least, our youngest child is the bioplastics uh, industry. So some word about starch and bioplastics. Uh, most of you might know what starch is. For those who do not know, it is a carbohydrate, the storage carbohydrate in plants. In our case, we process wheat, corn, and potatoes and get the starch out, but also the proteins and the fibers and so on. And it, it is a polysaccharide uh, consisting of uh, glucose units. There are two types of molecules uh, in, in these plants. It's amylose and amylopectin. The difference is the bond. Uh, the one is 1,4 uh, glycosidic bond, and the other one also has 1, point, uh, uh, one to 6 uh, glycosidic bonds. Um, now stepping into the topic of bioplastic itself. Um, how is it possible to introduce or first to produce a, a starch to make it thermoplastic and then make a final product out of it? So there's different ways. Uh, one way that we do is uh, we take the starch, this powder, and extrude it together with additives and produce a thermoplastic uh, plasticized starch out of it. In our case, it is called uh, Amitroplast, the brand name. But I do not want to talk mainly about our brand and our developments, but as uh, about thermoplastic starch and starch in, in bioplastic products in general. Uh, after that, uh, this uh, thermoplastic starch is compounded with other biopolymers, can be PBT, PLA, and others. Uh, this is what our customers are doing and what we ourselves are doing. We also produce compounds of, uh, out of our starch. Uh, and depending on the formulation of this compound, uh, uh, the customers uh, uh, get their finished uh, products, be it bags or other types of products, extruded or injected ones. There's another way of bringing starch as such into compounds. This is uh, the direct way, I'd say the one-step way. So you take this powder uh, together with additives and other biopolymers and make a one-step compound where you uh, get your, your final compound. All right, this is uh, this step. This is something that not everybody is able to do uh, because starch as a powder is not so easy to treat in, in, in the processing. Uh, that's why thermoplastic starch, and you see it here in the picture, these granules are, have added value. First, of, first uh, they are already in the, in the form of granules, uh, can be treated easily in the, in the process of a compounder. And the second thing is it is already plasticized and uh, more easily to be, to be handled in the compounding step. Uh, some words about how to produce thermoplastic starch uh, and starch blends out of it. Um, it is long known uh, how thermoplastic starch is to be produced. Uh, you find a lot of literature here. Uh, the more interesting thing is uh, how you exactly do it. You know, how, uh, which, which, uh, which process parameters you apply in order to get the TPS uh, that, is, uh, that gives a real good uh, behavior, not only in the compounding, but later on uh, for the finished products and the, the shaping. Um, when we have this flow chart here, it again shows uh, how to, to, to produce thermoplastic starch. Um, we, in our case, we use native starch. You could also use modified starch. Um, it has some uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, there's uh, certain plasticizers um, who interact with the H, bond in, uh, in, uh, H bonds and uh, additives uh, to fine tune the final characteristics of the final product that has been produced uh, uh, with or from our thermoplastic starch. In fact, in the uh, production process of thermoplastic starch, uh, there's a kind of destructuring and plasticizing process that uh, that happens with the starch. <clears throat> uh, 
And the thermoplastic starch as such is not really a, a, a plastic as you would expect it uh, or are used to from uh, others, PLA, PVT, but maybe also polyolefins. Uh, it, it, it is more a semi-plasticized uh, uh, product or pre-plasticized product. Uh, and it melts when it is uh, when it is exposed to heat and shear forces. What we have seen at Agrana Starch, and we took uh, quite a deep look into that uh, topic, um, we have seen that uh, the starch as such, but also the plasticizer or the additives, and also the process parameters during this uh, production step are crucial impact factors. Uh, first, for the resulting TPS as such, for the quality, <coughs> how it looks, how it behaves uh, during compounding, but also for the quality of the final product. Um, we have seen several products that contain quite big amounts of plasticizers or additives. Or that's okay when doing the compounding step, but if you have, if you see the, the final uh, properties, uh, the properties of the final product, you might be disappointed uh, because uh, there's always two sides. First, you have to compound it. Well, if that works nicely, that's okay. But also, the final product has to have good, uh, has to have a good quality. And that's what we have been uh, working uh, quite a lot on about uh, to get both of these uh, things into into one material. Uh, on this picture, you see two, two colors uh, of thermoplastic starch. The white one is made from wheat in this case, and the yellow one is made from corn. Good. Uh, to summarize and to give you an overview why to use TPS, I, I can point this out for TPS in general, but specifically for our Amitroplast, where I know about the details. Um, one of the major advantages is that starch uh, as such is not easy to handle, you know, this powder. Um, but TPS and of course Amitroplast, it is uh, easy to, 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 to handle and to dose into the compounder. And, um, Preferably, it should be a twin screw ex uh, extruder, uh, a twin screw compounder. Otherwise, it will not be possible to apply this uh, energy and this uh, shear forces uh, into the uh, into the compounding step. Um, the native starch, the starch powder, as such, is also not easy to compound. So, a TPS, and in this case, a metroplast, offers also improved properties here to get the starch uh, more easily into the, the into the matrix polymer. Most of the time, and especially for metroplast, uh, TPS is 100% bio-based, and it is certified industrial and home compostable, which is also important. Why is it important? On the one hand, of course, bio-based content is always, uh, also these days, uh, with regards to, to uh, um, avoiding uh, uh, carbon footprint uh, in, in that regard. Uh, but also home compostability is uh, something that uh, customers are more and more asking. Also legislation is, is, is requiring. So what we see is that uh, when you combine um, a thermoplastic starch with other biopolymers uh, that are not uh, home compostable by nature, by themselves, uh, you can achieve home compostability in combination with, uh, with a thermoplastic starch. Um, of course, the ability to be compounded with other polymers is also important. Uh, starch plays a big role, I would say, in flexibles uh, in combination with PBAT, but also in combination with PLA and PBAT, and then we move slowly into injection molding, of course. And um, but also uh, when we when we talk about PBS and PHA, you, uh, you, this uh, combination is possible. The mechanical characteristics of the final products not to be forgotten. So it doesn't help if the, the, the final film uh, does not exceed uh, tensile strength, I don't know, of uh, 10 megapascal. Uh, it should be, uh, of course, more than, than this 10. Uh, usually in our case, it's uh, 25, 30, 35, or in this area. 
um, as I mentioned before, uh, the starch is produced in Austria from corn and wheat coming from Austria and neighboring countries. Unfortunately, we do not process uh, wheat, for example, from, from, from the Nordics. That's a bit too far to bring the, the, uh, the um, uh, cereals, the wheat, uh, into. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a regional product. It has not to be shipped over an ocean. And also from the, from the process point of view, uh, thermoplastic starch, you do not have losses during production. You do not have a carbon dioxide uh, um, by in, during fermentation and things like this. So the, the, the kilogram you put into your extruder, you get the kilogram out. Um, yeah, as Gunilla explained already today and highlighted and, and, and gave some interesting insights, availability is a big topic these days. Our thermoplastic starch as such is available and it is economical uh, compared with other biopolymers. Our, and there's a, it's, a sta it's a product that is uh, available on a stable basis with regards to availability as such, but also with regards to, to the price. And this is also interesting uh, to be not so exposed to, to certain uh, ingredients uh, being shipped over the ocean, uh, not talking about logistics these days. Um, we have a long history in starch, in, in Agrano starch here, we have developed many things in starch for many industries. So you can be assured that uh, we know what we are talking about also when talking about this thermoplastic starch here. And it was especially designed for the bioplastics industry. So not filled up with a lot of plasticizer uh, just to, to get it uh, plasticized somehow. It is really, uh, it, it gives a good uh, uh, product uh, and, a, and a good compounding process. What we also see is thermoplastic starch is not somehow so easy to be that, that, uh, that customers work with. Uh, when they get PLA or PBAT, they find out rather easily or know how to, to treat it. For starch products, this is not the case in, in, in most of the cases as, as, as we experience. And this is what I want to highlight again here, that we can and are open to support your projects and, and, and your process and your, your compound setup of your, of your screw, but also the analytics. Are, we have means to identify within some yeah, I wouldn't say uh, hours, but uh, within some uh, days, how well your compounding process uh, was, has been, uh, and how well the starch has been incorporated in the compound, which is crucial, of course, for the final characteristics. Uh, these days, we are doing this online very often, but also uh, on site, which is possible now uh, again. And we are doing this hands on, uh, either on site or online within, within some. Uh, some days or some, some hours if necessary. Last but not least, let me show you some, some pictures of products made uh, with Amitroplast TPS. Uh, the bags also were to be well composted in the home compost. Are uh, several uh, um, um, bubble films and pillows for, for sending goods. Also films, cast films uh, for thermoforming uh, and uh, these this clips and applications uh, for, for products that sooner or later will stay in nature and will or have to biodegrade there and uh, thermoplastic starch here also creates an, a good value because the biodegradability is very good. So that's all for today from my side. Thank you for your attention. Uh, my contact data you'll find here. Uh, if you need more information, I added two, uh, two addresses, the one from our bioplastics side and the one uh, we have a nice video on the YouTube uh, channel. And if you are in Germany, in Friedrichshafen, in about uh, 10 days, 14 days, uh, it would be great to see you in at, at our booth at the, at the Fakuma Fair. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I hope that something new was uh, in our presentation here. And again, thank you for your attention. Hey, thank you, Gottfried. Very interesting. A lot of questions actually coming up here. 
Uh, I had one first. Uh, the, the, uh, I wouldn't say a simple one, but how, how do you in, how do you uh, approach the, this uh, continuously ongoing discussion about making plastics out of potential food? Uh, I mean, I mean, it's ridiculous many times since we know that the total arable land that is used to bioplastics is 0.01% or something like that, and uh, that we actually don't need to grow any more food. It would be better to take care of the food that we actually produce today to, to, to prevent people from starving. But this discussion comes up many times, especially from NGOs. Do you meet it and how do you handle it? Of course, it's an old story and we do not talk about land use because everyone in the auditorium is familiar with this. Uh, we have the discussion coming from bioethanol business um, already 10, 15 years back. And uh, in fact, we have, uh, we have the biggest part of our starch production, but not only of ours, but uh, worldwide is I'd say not going into food. Uh, it's going into non-food applications. If, if, if I think about paper business, where we are also uh, selling our, our wheat and corn, but also potato starches into uh, the, amount, the amount of starch being used in, 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 in paper is, is huge. Um, I reckon that also most other bio polyesters or polymers have a kind of carbohydrate as a source. And this carbohydrate more or less or very often also comes from a from a chain, a molecule that is very similar to starch, either be it starch or be it uh, sugar, um, saccharose. Um, that's the second thing. And what we also do is that we make a distinction between uh, food uh, and, and, and non-food products. And as mainly uh, most of us know that we have in, in Europe, we do not have a lack of, of carbohydrates, of starch or something like that. We have a lack of proteins. And uh, when, we, when we take out the, the, the carbohydrates of the, of the raw materials, uh, we can create uh, um, products containing higher percentage of proteins, which is highly valued, not only in the feed industry, but also in the food industry. We're talking about bakery application but also aquafeed uh, when talking about the, 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 the wheat protein. Okay. So, of course, uh, these are only some thoughts. Uh, there are many more, and this discussion will never end anyhow. I know. Not be I know. Yeah. And it did come up here, so I just wanted to. But what type of additives is needed to make starch thermoplastic? Uh, there are several ones. Uh, the most well known are glycerol and, and, and sorbitol. And then there are some, uh, I call it magic ingredients. I do not want to highlight too much about them, uh, but you'll certainly find them in literature, but also in certain patents uh, to fine tune uh, the, the behavior and after the extrusion or the, the, the extrusion process, how the, how the uh, strands coming out of the extruder behave and how it can be formed to, to get a good uh, granule and a good, uh, good material. But it's not some fossil material. No, because uh, then it would not be 100%. <laughs> no, that's um, can this material become a European alternative to the Brascam uh, sugarcane bio PE? Unfortunately not. <laughs> but thank you for this question. Uh, no, uh, a thermoplastic starch uh, cannot be used as such. It always has to be compounded with another biopolymer and uh, to combine this uh, combine the properties of, of the, the polymers. Uh, uh, bio P is P uh, from, from mechanical characteristics point of view and therefore uh, unfortunately not, uh, but it could be a part of it. Uh, we had also the questions about how to, what about uh, combining TPS and polyethylene? I mean, Hmm. That's a difficult question. Uh, if you're thriving for increased bio-based content in, in fossil-based PE, yes, but uh, afterwards you only trade microplastic, more or less, and that's not the sense of it. And uh, usually it's also not so easy, depending on the on the modification or the thermoplastic starch, uh, to, to combine PE and, and thermoplastic starch because the the, the melt flow and, and these characteristics is totally different. 
there is thermoplastic starch that is promoted to be compounded with polyethylene, as far as I know. But first, we do not see the reason or the sense in, in combining these two materials. And, and the second thing is, uh, then it contains rather more plasticizer uh, that, it, um, that makes it compatible with uh, polyethylene, up to our experience. How is the barrier properties of the films produced? Uh, depending on the on the matrix polymer, I'd say our, our starch is a hydrophilic uh, polymer. So when talking about, about oxygen, uh, it is uh, you can work more or less. You you have the same uh, uh, the same uh, the same values as the matrix polymer uh, for the water vapor. Uh, it uh, it decreases it, uh, but this is always uh, something that is wished uh, because these bags they they let the water in and out and make maybe food that is packed into if it's only for two or three days, or uh, to not to not to uh, how to say not to rotten or to, um, um, to 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 lose the quality of this uh, of this food that is packed here. Okay. Uh, I just noticed in the beginning when you show where you were active that the Nordic area was quite gray. You don't have any business up here or? Uh, we do have business, but we do not have a production site there. Um, for commodities, I mean, if you talk about uh, the huge volumes, it's already a bit far to go. Uh, and it doesn't, make, uh, it doesn't make sense also from an economical point of view. Uh, and for special products, uh, there is uh, for sure business in, in, in Scandinavia, yes. Okay. I think there is a lot of more questions. You have to take a look at them later and, and answer them. I, so. I think we are, we should stop at three o'clock, <laughs> so we are passing time. So thank you, Gottfried. And I, I suppose you can ensure us that there will still be snow in the Alps this winter, even though the global warming, or am I right? <laughs> Yes, I think so. I think okay. so. So if uh, someone of you will be near Salzburg, uh, please let me know. All right. <laughs> Let's have it here. <laughs> Thank you and good presentation. Thank you for being with you. Thanks. All the best. Bye-bye. Okay, uh, then we come to an end. As we said, we will try to, to have some answers for the speakers for the questions that we couldn't manage due to time questions. There was a lot of questions, uh, actually, and that's good because then we realized that this is a great interest for all of you. I really hope that you have had a good one hour and a half and that you got some valuable information that you appreciate to get it free of charge from uh, the Nordic Bioplastic Organization. Uh, the best way to, to show that you like it is to become a member, actually, and help us to improve this information channel even more. So don't hesitate. Take a look at our homepage and and and, uh, and uh, uh, register for a membership. Uh, next time will be in November 16. The program is not exactly set yet, but uh, we are thinking about also getting a view from a raw material producer about the the supply chains for for for, for um, bioplastics and also maybe some new products uh, coming up. Uh, so we are working on the program. We let you know uh, you will not miss anything. So thank you very much for today and see you again in uh, November 16. Bye-bye.